All right, all right. Can, can you all hear me okay? Can you all hear me okay? Well, so C.S. Lewis has a quote. He says uh, that joy is the serious business of heaven. And there was a lot of business going on Friday night. It was just an awesome time with Night to Shine. So my name is Brian Shout. Uh, I'm the college pastor here. I work with the students from Oregon State and Lynn Benton. And I'm going to be kind of the next up talking about this series, uh, the four portrait series that we're covering of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the, the Gospels, the, four, the first four books of the New Testament. And uh, specifically, we're, gonna, we're still in Matthew, so I'm talking about Matthew. And we're going to dig into a story in Matthew 15. Uh, but overall, this series, it's just talking about... Um, um, uh, G, uh, Matthew, his portrayal of Jesus as the Messiah, that's what he really focuses on. And just to start, I want to use an analogy that if you have been reading uh, the Gospels, if you know the story of Jesus um, pretty well, or maybe you're reading it for the first time and you're just looking for a way to have some organization with a lot of the things that he does throughout his life, because um, he just, I mean, it's a full life. He does a lot of things. So um, some ways to think about this, some handles to grip to create some organization in our mind for the life of Jesus. It would be similar to uh, something we we're familiar about if you, uh, if you have Netflix. Um, they, we can break up uh, Jesus' life into seasons or a TV show, let's say, of Jesus' life where there's a big narration of all of the things, the whole plot of what Jesus' life is. And within the whole TV show, there's multiple seasons, and the seasons have their own plot, and they're made up of individual episodes. Normally, uh, you know, if you've watched a TV show, that there are, um, in each episode, there's kind of a mini story in each episode. Maybe it kind of leads in from another one, or it goes into another story as well. But um, overall, this is, this is kind of a good depiction. I want to talk about five seasons that might help you organize where we're going to be in the story that we're going to talk about with Jesus life in this portrait series. So season one is kind of the early life of Jesus. Everything up until the point that uh, of the Jesus that we, that we really know and he begins his ministry. So that's season one. Season two <clears throat> is kind of an inauguration season, inauguration year where he begins a lot of the ministry that, he, that we know and that we love Jesus for. Season three after that is, is when he starts the rise, the popularity. He does a lot of the, he walks on water, he feeds the 5,000. He does a lot of things that get him on the scene and get him really popular, get a, get a lot of momentum coming. And then season four, uh, the haters come, and he has the season of opposition, that's season four, where uh, the popularity spikes up, and the opposition also comes to meet him as well. And then in season five, we have the very last week, the, the, there's a whole fifth season dedicated to the entire last week of Jesus' life called the Passion Week, where there's just a lot of jam-packed things um, in the Gospels about the last week and some of the calculated things that he was doing. So hopefully that gives you some handles to be able to organize where we're at. We're actually going to be talking about a story in an early episode of season four, and that's the the uh, opposition, the season of opposition, early episode. Uh, so some of the backstory here, um, we are, we, Jesus in chapter 14, I'm going to scoot that back, um, has just finished walking on water in this little lake in the bottom right hand corner. And then he goes after that to the west part of the Sea of Galilee to a town called Gennesaret and, uh, and spends a lot of his time in the west area. This is a, it's a Jewish region he, in Capernaum. If you've read up to this point, he spends a lot of time in this area. And uh, in this time, in, in the beginning of chapter 15, a delegation of Pharisees and Sadducees come up from Jerusalem about 100 miles, which is, you know, Portland, just as a reference, is 80 ish, 85 miles from here. And so they travel this delegation of Pharisees and Sadducees, which were essentially the, the opposition, right? They were the haters. They were the people that, that uh, were uh, the, the main opposers of what Jesus was doing. They sent a delegation 100 miles via camel, horse, or foot somehow to Jerus or from Jerusalem to Gennesaret to confront Jesus about a very specific religious law about how their disciples wash their hands before they eat. And mainly, you know, the main 
the main point of that is not maybe necessarily that they came up to get his insight or to pick his brain about this, but that they were showing their presence and their opposition to Jesus' ministry and what he was doing there. Um, and so you can imagine that this process was pretty unnerving. I mean, Jesus handles it well, uh, obviously. He, he always, you see all this, this great upside down kingdom language and this profound insight that Jesus brings in these interactions to the opposition with the Pharisees and Sadducees. Um, but after that, he needs a break. So he, he leaves, he departs. Um, and we see this theme in Jesus's life. If you've, if you've been following with, uh, Matthew and following Jesus's life where he'll spend a lot of time healing or he'll spend a lot of time teaching or he'll spend a lot of time with opposition and then he needs a break. So he'll go, um, and he'll go out and either spend extended periods of time in solitude or in prayer or in just resting away. So that is the backstory to where we're going. He just kind of has this, I mean, it would be similar to like if the FBI flew from Washington, D.C. and showed up at your house and started picking a fight with you about some of the laws that you may or may not have broken. It's a pretty unnerving process. So uh, uh, he, he departs, and that is where we begin the story. So we're in Matthew chapter 15, uh, verses 21 through 28. So you can turn there. We do have the words up on the screen, so I'll, I'll, I'll read those, and then we'll, we'll dive into it. So Matthew 15, uh, 21 through 28, leaving that place uh, that we just described, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him, Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. So what a weird story. What a bizarre story. You don't have to pretend like, oh, yeah, this is, this is normal. Uh, up to this point, it's not normal for Jesus to have such hesitation in healing someone. And so that's kind of this different portrayal that we want to talk about. Uh, so before we do that, let's pray and then we'll dive into it. Um, Lord, we just lift this story up to you. We thank you for showing this side of, of who you are and just allow us to fully understand and to bring your words and your wisdom um, and your heart to us in this. Thank you in your name. Amen. All right, so Jesus leaves a supercharged situation with the Pharisees and Sadducees from Galilee and goes uh, to two towns, Tyre and Sidon. Now, the west side of, of Sea of Galilee is very Jewish, and up to this point, Jesus spends almost all, he spends all of his time in Jewish regions, but he withdraws to two non-Jewish or Gentile regions. Gentile represents non-Jew, Jewish people. Uh, over by the, the coast, the, I just use coast because I'm from Oregon, but by the Mediterranean Sea with Tyre and Sidon. And he's probably doing this to get away, to not be in a place that so many people know who he is and recognize him and the Pharisees and Sadducees can come and pick a fight with him. He's, you know, always, always on guard, always in, on the defense. But the plan's kind of foiled because he does run into someone that recognizes him. I mean, he moves to a place that it's like if you went up to Portland, like no one would know uh, who you are necessarily. So he kind of got away with that. But he ran into someone that knows him. And, and then they go and, uh, and have this interaction with a Canaanite woman. And so we have to pause really quick, uh, have a little quiz for you. Canaanites, good people, bad people. Bad people. They're bad people, right? Bad people. They're the antagonists in this story. In the Old Testament, Israelites versus Canaanites. Not, yeah, not good. They are, they are rivals. And the best example that I could come up with this would be ducks and beavers, man. Ducks and beavers. <laughs> 
Like, that, that's the best. And that was probably the thing that resonated with you most. And I didn't want to use this example because if, you, if I don't know you super well, uh, I have a very conflicted soul on this issue. Just some backstory. I, I probably inherited some of the strongest beaver blood in this church. Shout out to my mom um, and my dad and my sister. Uh, and uh, then I went to U of O. <laughs> And I graduated from the University of Oregon, and guess where I am now? Back here working with Oregon State students. So I have a deeply conflicted soul on this issue, but yet this is the best representation of the rivalry between Israel and Canaan. Someone's got to be the Canaanites. And so after spending a lot of time in prayer and solitude and silence and assessing my heart uh, and searching my heart, I finally have figured out who the antagonists are in this story, the Huskies. Because <laughs> no one likes the Huskies, maybe except Elise <laughs> or Bruce, Bruce. <laughs> um, yeah, no one likes the Husky. So this UW grad of a Canaanite woman comes to the Jewish Messiah, Jesus, and says a very interesting phrase. She says, have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. And that's a, that's a very bizarre phrase. Uh, it kind of paints the picture with this whole uh, rivalry thing that we're talking about. But it's very interesting. She says, have mercy on me, Lord, or master, son of David. And that's, that term, son of David, is very commonly used by Matthew to indicate the theme of his portrait of Jesus, which is his messiahship. It's his, the king of the Jews, the king of Israel. That, that King David, uh, the, uh, which was, you know, David and Goliath, famous, famous king in the nation of Israel, that Jesus was coming out of the lineage of David. Therefore, he's the son of David. And she recognizes that. And that's a very bizarre thing. She acknowledges that, that she has an understanding, even though she's a Gentile woman, a Canaanite woman, that Jesus is uh, the Jewish Messiah. It's super bizarre. It'd be like if Chris Peterson, does anyone know who Chris Peterson is? I'm going to scoot that back. Um, he's the head football coach at UW. And uh, it'd be like if he went to, from Seattle, he drove down to Corvallis to meet up with Jonathan Smith, who's the head football coach of the Beavers. And Chris Peterson goes up to Jonathan Smith and says, have mercy on me. Coach Smith, master, <laughs> lord of football. <laughs> it's just super weird. Like, it's, it's a bizarre situation that wouldn't normally happen. And what does Jesus, how does Jesus respond? Does he say, oh, I'm very honored that you recognize me as the son of David, right? And therefore, I'm going to heal your demon-possessed daughter? What does he do? Silence. Does not address her. Does not speak a word. What a weird response. Um, the disciples in the next verse, they, they talk about, uh, they kind of add fuel to this situation, to the fire here by saying, they recognize what's going on. They're saying, hey, send her away. Send her away, for she keeps on crying out after us. And that Greek word for crying out uh, refers to uh, someone to croak or this cry of a raven. Has anyone heard of the cry of a raven or a crow or whatever? It's very loud. It's very annoying. Um, and that's what they're saying. Send this woman away. Send this Canaanite woman away, for she is very loud and annoying. She's crying out after us. And so after a long period of silence, Jesus uh, finally speaks. And what does he say? He says, uh, I am only here for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Pretty clear statement, right? Like whatever Jesus was doing, she's not a part of, and her daughter's not a part of either. And that's a weird, that's, that's the, that's, that seems like a weird thing. I was uncomfortable reading that. Uh, I mean, you might be uncomfortable reading that. That might break a little bit of boundaries in how we portray Jesus in our own mind, that he's having such hesita hesitation and such opposition to healing this woman's demon-possessed daughter. And this is a point that I really want to emphasize the reason why he said this, because this phrase, the loss, I'm here for the, the lost sheep of the house of, of Israel, is something that he said in Matthew 10, just a little bit earlier when he, was, when he was kind of sending out and commissioning his disciples to go out. He says, do not go on a road that leads to Gentile regions and do not enter any Samaritan town. 
Go instead to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, preach this message, the kingdom of heaven is near. So he's, he's telling them, don't go to Gentile areas. Don't go to Samaritan areas. Why is he doing that? Why is he having such hesitation healing this Samaritan or this, uh, this Canaanite woman? And uh, the reason being that Jesus, and this is an important point, is homed in, laser focused to a very, very specific goal, which is to enact God's covenant and his commitment to the Israelite people, the chosen people. That is what he's, he's there to do. That is an incredibly big but specific thing that requires Jesus to say no to a lot of other things as well. And that's the situation that we're arriving in, that Jesus, in his mind, he has a very specific goal with his life, and that's, this isn't part of it. And he says no to everything else to be able to say yes to this very important specific goal. And maybe that resonates with us as well, um, that there are things it, that we're spread thin, right? We're Americans, we're spread thin. We, we like to do, dig into a lot of different things, put our fingers in a bunch of cookie jars. Maybe you're spread thin with your time or you're spread thin with your money or you're spread thin with, with your energy. And this challenge that we see to imitate what Jesus is doing here, to realize that whatever God's plan is for your life, to look at the three C's, Christ, church, community, that we've been saying here. Literally, Mike's been preaching to you here to figure out God's full and free life for you, to figure that out and say no to things that aren't that and say yes to what that is. Maybe that's what you need to hear this morning um, as well. Because think of all the things that Jesus didn't do while he was here. Like, he didn't have a family. Um, shout out to all the kids here that are from the nursery. Uh, Jesus didn't have kids. Um, he didn't have kids. He didn't write a book. The Bible's about Jesus, but he didn't write a book of the Bible. Uh, he didn't go travel any place. He actually spent the majority of his life within like a hundred mile radius of this very small section of land compared to our whole entire planet to, talking to a very small amount of people for a very specific goal. He, he was laser focused on something and was saying no to everything else. Think of all the things that we wish he would have preached, that he, we wish he would have said that were in the Bible that aren't there. A, B, C, D, political stuff that we wish would have provided so much clarity if Jesus would have said it. Not there. Doesn't care. Not important. He's there for a super specific thing that is to enact his father's promise on the people of Israel and his covenant with them. So that's an important point. And so he says to this woman, hey, uh, I am, I'm here for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Uh, and this is, this is great. I love the Canaanite woman here because she's mama bear. She's taking care of her demon-possessed daughter. She says this, and she, she just does not not care. Like, <laughs> she just keeps, in fact, he, so she says, I was sent only to the last uh, house. I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But what her response is is she comes, and she bows before him and says, help me, Lord, like, please continue to help me. And at this point, we're probably thinking like, all right, here's where Jesus is, here's where Jesus' is, uh, compassion comes in. Here's the Jesus that we know. She's coming before him physically. She's kneeling before him saying, help me after these two rejections. Here's where it comes. Here's where his compassion comes. But what does he say? It's not right to give the children's bread to the dogs. He calls her a dog. It's pretty harsh, right? And I want to point out two things that, that ex might explain this better. It is, it is a super harsh thing, but it probably one was not something that she was surprised to hear. Uh, it was kind of a common name to call Gentile people dogs um, in the Jewish community. So it's like when he referenced her as a dog, it probably, she wasn't like, whoa, I've never heard that one before. Like, 
oh, that hurt. Um, she was probably somewhat familiar with the, with the term. And two, uh, the Greek word that Jesus uses for dog is not necessarily like how we would use, call someone a dog, like a street dog, a mangy, whatever. It's actually referring to a small uh, dog, kind of like this one, like one of those yappy dogs that's in your house that you love um, and adore, and it's part of your family. This, does anyone recognize this dog? Does anyone know whose dog this is? This is Rick Herbert's dog. <laughs> this pastor, this is a long-haired chihuahua named Minnie. And Minnie is what Jesus is calling this Canaanite UW grad woman. UW is at, the Huskies are, this reference is still going strong with this dog analogy. Um, but anyway, this is what he calls her. He calls her uh, like one of these small house dogs. And so here's the important, here, here's like the most impressive thing that the Canaanite woman says after this in reply to this. Hey, children, don't, you know, it's not right for the children's bread to be fed to the dogs. And she says, yeah, I understand. I know. Oh, there's Rick. Um, I was looking for you. Um, she's like, yeah, I understand. I understand. I'm a Canaanite woman. I understand I'm not Jewish and you're the Jewish Messiah. I'm out. I'm out of the club but I'm in the house and the dogs get some of the crumbs too. It's a very bold statement. It's a very profound statement that, that she says to Jesus as well. Um, and what is Jesus' response back? Oh woman, you have great faith. Notice that shift from dog to woman. Oh woman, you have great faith. And that phrase that he says, you have great faith. It's actually juxtaposed with something that happened just, just, just prior. Um, if we kind of rewind back to the very beginning of what I was saying, you remember we're kind of entering in from Jesus walking on the water. Well, in that scene, Peter, one of his disciples, is in the boat, sees Jesus, says, hey, Jesus, is that you? Jesus says, yeah. And then he says, well, invite me out on the water to come see you. And Jesus says, all right, come on out. And so Peter actually starts walking on the water, but he starts to sink and he gets scared. And Jesus has to come over and save him and pull him out. And what does Jesus say to Peter? Oh, you of little faith. Peter, the rock, Jesus' disciple. Oh, you of little faith, little faith. Canaanite woman, the dog, enemy of Israel, you have great faith. It's pretty, it's pretty profound that he would call this woman that after calling his kind of number one guy someone with little faith. And this, this, um, this representation of a dog with the Gentiles versus the children of Israel, um, dogs just being like someone that's far from God someone that is apart, farther from God, maybe that resonates with you. It resonates with me a lot of the time, that I feel far from God, that my actions actually don't draw me closer to God, that I'm misaligned, that I live my day on Sunday a different way than I, than I live throughout the, the rest of the week, um, and that I'm apart, that I feel apart from God, that I'm out of sync, that I'm misaligned. And then in that misalignment, we continue on with life, and suffering comes. I was at a pastor's prayer summit um, this last week, Monday through Wednesday, and Pastor Steve uh, was there. He's one of the six facilitators that organizes the pastor's prayer summit, and he, on Tuesday morning, he was talking about Psalm 84, and he was talking about the valley, moving through the valley of Baca, and Baca is the Hebrew word for weeping, and he was saying, we all, Pastor Steve was saying, we all live in the valley of weeping. We all live in this valley of pain and brokenness and suffering, and it's called life. <laughs> and a lot of you have experienced that. And if you haven't, buckle up, because it's coming. We live in the valley of weeping. This, this woman, this demon-possessed, uh, this Canaanite woman with a demon-possessed daughter, she lives in the valley of weeping. Her daughter's demon-possessed. And maybe you're possessed by an addiction or you have a broken relationship or your bank account is empty or you lose your job or the test results show cancer. 
that's the valley of Baca. That's the valley of weeping. And we live there. And we live there. And in that misalignment of being far from God, when the suffering comes, then we approach God after that. And we, and we say what the Canaanite woman says, have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. And, how does, and, and what's the reply that Jesus gives? Silence. Or no. Or it is not right for the children to give their bread to the dogs. And at that moment, we have a choice to either turn our backs and curse God or to be like the Canaanite woman and move closer and kneel before God in a physical posture and say, yeah, I understand. I understand I'm far from you, but even the dogs get the crumbs and have a spiritual posture as well. Um, and we know the ending of the episode, right? We know how it ends. I just read it. He heals the demon-possessed daughter. He says, oh, woman, you have great faith. Your daughter is, you know, your request is granted. Your daughter is healed. And that actually, that, that moment where he heals uh, this Gentile girl is, is a profound foreshadowing of this narrative that we're talking about, this, this Netflix TV show of Jesus' life, this profound foreshadowing, along with what the Roman, along with the healing of the Roman centurion, who was a servant, who was another Jewish person that Mike talked about last week, that these moments of him breaking out of his laser focus for the Jewish people as the Jewish Messiah and healing people that aren't Jewish was a profound foreshadowing to his resurrection and the Great Commission. Because remember in Matthew 10, what we were talking about before, the instruction to the disciples was, hey, don't go out to any Gentile roads. Don't go out to any Samaritan roads. Stick to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and preach to them. And then, and then post-resurrection, that was pre-resurrection. Post-resurrection, Jesus says in Matthew 28 in the Great Commission, I've been given all authority under power, uh, under heaven, and go into all nations. All of them baptizing those in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. N.T. Wright is a New Testament scholar. He says it best. It's a great quote. He says that the disciples and perhaps Jesus himself weren't ready for Calvary. But this woman, this foreign Canaanite woman, was already insisting Easter. This powerful stuff. We live in the Valley of Weeping. But pursue God in that with relentless perseverance and faith until we hear God say, Oh, woman, oh, man, you have great faith. Come closer. Come closer to me. I know. I know you're in the valley. I know you're in the valley of weeping. I know you have struggle. I know you have pain. I feel them too. But come closer. Psalm 84, look around that corner. Do you see around that corner? That's Zion. My house is over there. Won't you join me? Won't you join me to that place, with me to that house? Won't you join him in the midst of the valley of weeping to have perseverance and faith. Because let me tell you a secret. Canaanite woman, Jesus heals her demon-possessed daughter. She didn't leave the valley of weeping. <laughs> She's alive, right? She has a pulse. She's still in it. Uh, she still experienced hardship. Her daughter still experienced hardship, even in the midst of Jesus' moment of healing them but that moment was a profound foreshadowing that this Canaanite woman not only got a chance to glimpse around the corner, but baby, she turned it. She turned that corner. She entered in. So in the midst of the, the pain and the suffering, be like this Canaanite woman. Come before Lord with great perseverance and faith. So let's hold on to that as we pray. 
God, thank you for sending your son here to reflect and teach us more about you and the story of the Canaanite woman. We just thank you so much. Help us to learn from it and imitate, uh, to have great faith and perseverance through the valley of weeping as she did. Uh, I love you. In your name, amen. All right. Thank you very much. That's all we have. I don't think we're doing a last song. Um, enjoy surviving Snowmageddon 2019 and um, have a good week. <laughs>